Come on. Like, you got to dance to it. Like, it's just so good. It's just so good. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Super excited to be here again with the last of our coaching panels for now. Future ones will be coming, but for October, this is the final of them. So I'm excited. I'm here with Zara, and we're going to be talking about writer's block. And this one is, I, I think, going to be a really interesting one because we have two differing opinions and uh, approaches to writer's block based on different experiences and stuff. So because this is something that we obviously see a lot within the author community uh, discussing, like, is writer's block a thing? Is it a figment of our imaginations? And um, I think that there is a, a, a middle ground between those. It's not a lack of things to write. I don't think that's ever the actual case. <laughs> so it's going to be a good time today, guys. And just to kind of give you a quick rundown of everything, if you haven't already, make sure to go and subscribe to the channel um, because we have some fun new content starting next week called Coffee Chats. And the Coffee Chats will be bringing in authors. Um, we're going to be discussing all sorts of different topics. It'll be different, a little less formal, a little bit more laid back, as it were, with Coffee Chats uh, versus just like the coaching streams. And we're going to be talking to other authors. So it's going to be a great time and it's going to be hosted by Mackenzie Finkley and Kyra Dawkins, who you guys have, um, seen in a couple of the previous coaching panels and Preptober live streams. So make sure that you guys tune in for that and keep an eye out for it. It's going to be scheduled sometime early next week. If you're subscribed and you have the bell notification icon, you'll remember. So make sure to go and do that. Uh, also, Monday is going to be our nano live stream kickoff. And then we're going to be doing live streams every single Monday at 4 p.m. Pacific time and 7 p.m. Eastern time. Yes. <laughs> it's going to be a great time. Uh, we're, we're just going to hit the ground hard in writing your books. And we'll have like a brief topic beforehand just to kind of set the mood. Um, so get the bring the candles, bring the champagne. It'll be a great time. Uh, now we're going to jump into the topic for today. And Zara is going to be kicking us off today with a uh, history of, of, of a writer's block. Now all writers are created equal. So Zara, take us away. Yes. Thank you, Stephen. Very excited about everything you just said. <laughs> yes. We're starting coffee just next week. So make sure to attend. It'll be great fun. Um, yes. So let's jump right in. So I've been thinking about this a lot and doing some extensive research back in the day when I actually tried to help myself alleviate myself from the writer's block. So our legal system, and if I think about it, our culture actually as well works on a basis of precedence. And for a good reason, um, precedents can be powerful. They can acknowledge that what's currently happening to you has happened before in a sort of commiserating fashion that makes you feel just a little bit better um, about yourself. And um, that's what I want to talk to you about today. Um, so I already talked about my techniques for overcoming writer's block. So go watch previous live streams for, the, for those. And um, now today I want to give you, um, us writers actually, validation that we need that writer's block isn't a fancy term for laziness or a myth that is quite a taboo topic to discuss actually in the writer's community. Um, none of those things. It has a precedence in science. And I also mentioned once before that I didn't really believe in writer's block. And what I meant by that is I do believe that it's a real situation we're experiencing. It's just not what's really wrong with us. Um, I would equate it to when you have an inflamed sciatic nerve, your leg hurts like crazy, but the pain in the leg isn't the root of the problem. That's not what's really wrong with you. The pain is just a symptom. 
of course, the pain is real. It's very real. And everyone can see that you're in pain. Everyone believes you. But you have to treat sciatica, not the pain in the leg. And that's what a writer's block is, a symptom of a very specific process in our brain. Um, there is a scientific explanation for that. And the more writers learn about it, the better, because we need to learn what we're fighting here to determine a proper co course of treatment, and that makes sense. So um, afterwards, after we have educated ourselves, um, I'll give you a few examples of how some of the famous writers um, used to deal with a writer's block. So let's jump in. Um, so the term itself was first introduced in the 1940s, if I remember correctly, by a psychiatrist called Edmund Burglar. And um, Burglar studied writers who suffered from neurotic inhibitions of productivity, as he called it, um, in an attempt to determine why they were unable to create. And after conducting several interviews and spending years with writers suffering from creative problems, he discarded some of the theories that were popular at the time which was huge, but it wasn't highly publicized. So that's why a lot of people don't know about it. Um, what burglar, Jesus, oh, that is a terrible name to pronounce. I'll just call him Edmund, Ed. <laughs> okay, so Ed proved that um, block writers didn't drain themselves dry by exhausting their supply of inspiration, nor did they suffer from lack of external motivation. They didn't lack talent, they weren't lazy, and they weren't bored. So what was wrong with them? Um, so Ed studied the Freudian school of psychoanalysis and in a paper called Does, Writers, Does a Writer's Block Exist, um, published in American Image, Imago, American Image something, sorry, I don't remember. Um, it was a journal founded by Freud, by Freud and Ed in that journal argued that um, writers are like psychoanalysts. They unconsciously try to solve their inner problems via the medium of writing. A block writer is actually blocked psychologically and the way to unblock that writer is through therapy. Solve the personal psychological problem and you remove the blockage. And Ed's thinking was on the money. Um, then in the 1970s and 80s, actually, other psychologists named um, Jerome Singer and Michael Barrios tried to gain a more grounded understanding of what it meant to be creatively blocked. And they recruited a diverse group of writers, fiction, nonfiction, um, poetry, prose, all of that, some of whom were blocked and some of whom were fine. And the block writers had to fit a set of predetermined criteria. They had to present objective proof of their lack of writing progress and attest to a subjective feeling of being unable to write. And the symptoms have had to last him more than three months or at least three months. And what Barrios and Singer found by collecting all this info was that blog writers were unhappy. Symptoms of depression and anxiety, including increased self-criticism and reduced excitement and pride at work, were all of those were elevated in a block group, symptom of OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, self-doubt, procrastination, perfectionism, all of them shown on the docket, and as did feelings of helplessness and aversion to solitude, a major problem since writing usually requires some time alone. So in one group, actually, um, anxiety and stress dominated. The main impediment to writing was a deep emotional distress that sucked the joy out of writing. And in another group, unhappiness was expressed through anger and irritation at others. So Singer and um, what's his face? Barrios uh, <laughs> uh, found that uh, different kinds of unhappy writers are blocked differently. So the duo, duo proposed a simple intervention, exercises in directed mental imagery. So while some of the block writers met in groups to um, discuss their difficulties, Barrios and Singer asked, asked others to participate in a um, like a protocol designed to walk them through the production of color for mental images. And these writers would sit in a quiet room and contemplate a series of prompts asking them to produce, then describe dreamlike creations. And afterwards, they would visualize something from their current project and then generate a dreamlike experience based on that project. 
So it proved relatively successful. Writers who um, participated in an intervention approved their ability to get writing done and found themselves more mo motivated and self-confident. And um, the exercise didn't cure a writer's block across the board, but it did seem to demonstrate to the creatively um, stymied that they were still capable of creativity. So two biggest takeaways for me from the research that I've done over the years about this is first, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> if you look at other types of careers outside of professional writing, not many of those careers throw people into situations where they're forced to assess or explore their inner world. Therefore, there is no blockage in their brain to perform said work. They go through emotions every day. But notice when an extreme situation occurs in life, like an emotionally draining trauma, death in the family, breakup, etc., people shut down. They take a time off from work because they can't focus, or if they can't help but go to work, they perform terribly. Um, now take professional writing as a career into consideration. We are experiencing extreme emotional up and down, ups and downs through our characters day in, day out. We go through breakups, death in the family, trauma, or on the opposite side of the spectrum, um, but draining nonetheless, happiness, extreme happiness, weddings, grand gestures, time traveling, dragon slaying, etc. So we assess our emotional world every day. We face our inner workings every day. And our brain, bless him, by turning the switch off, is trying to protect us from this roller coaster. It goes, well, this writing thing that you're doing is causing you severe distress. If I turn off the creative part that is allowing you to hurt yourself like this, you won't be able to anymore. And the second takeaway from the all of the aforementioned, and I think a general advice that anyone can apply, um, from my understanding, the state of your creativity being shut down is amplified by the fact that you have no one to go through the process of writing with. Um, Stephen, myself, our author coach colleagues, Kyra, Emily McKenzie, and thousand other authors that published before, before us with New Degree Press, published successfully, kept the deadlines, overcame the writing block, because we all published through community-powered publishing. We weren't alone during the publishing journey. We had a tremendous amount of support. And that's why so few people who set to write a book actually publish it. And that's why we publish successfully. Now, <laughs> I've been talking for quite a while, so I'll just jump into a couple of examples from the classic writers that personally inspired me and then I'll be off. Um, so one, um, and this one is actually really great. So Graham Greene um, started a dream journal. If you remember your dreams in the morning when you wake up, which I bet you do because you are a creative and um, a dream is just another story made up by your brain, um, start writing them down and de detailing everything that you remember. That would be one. I started doing that. doesn't work for me anymore, but it did work at the beginning when I was just exploring writing and couldn't really write anything or so I thought. Um, and then, and this one I am using to this day, uh, Hillary Mantle's technique, get away from your desk. Strategy, take your computer, go to a park or a cafe or a friend's house and write there. Basically, change of scenery does wonders. So, writer's block, very real thing, proved by science. And hopefully, um, now we all have a better understanding of it and can move on more successfully in our careers. No, that was, that was super insightful. And I, I think that like so much of that makes sense based on what I know of how the brain works and it basically shutting down because it's like, it's like that, um, was it, uh, I think it's the scene from Tarzan where he's taking the, the, <laughs> The girl is like, stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself. It's like, oh, right. it's like stop hitting yourself. Like, yeah. stop doing this. Yes. This is dumb. Yes. And then it's finally like, you know what? I'm just going to not. 
Yes. <laughs> I'm not going to let you play there. It's a very much a defense mechanism. So um, many times in life, we feel like our body is punishing us for whatever we've been doing to it, but it's just trying to protect us. If we shut down physically, it's probably because we've been beating ourselves too much and doing too much work. So we feel like this is this surely is a punishment. It, it It's not. It's actually a blessing in disguise, because if our brain didn't shut down our body, we would have probably we would probably die <laughs> uh, because we, otherwise we wouldn't stop. So um, it it's an interesting notion, definitely a tough one to wrap your head around. But um, seeing a writer's block as a blessing to start assessing your emotional world in a more in a, in a healthy way let's be honest um yeah that can be very helpful and hopefully <laughs> our lovely writers will be able to do that from now on yeah uh, yeah i it, it's one of those things where you know the the longer i have so i mean i've been writing for 16 years and to varying degrees have had, you know, times of writer's block and, you know, not, and it wasn't for a lack of things to write. Again, that's not what writer's block no, is. That's not it. No, like you want to write, you have the desire to write, but something stands in between. Yep. And uh, that kind of gets into what my philosophy of writer's block is which is a combination of external and internal pressures. And so essentially the way that I define it is we have the external pressures, right? We have work, family, um, marriages, kids, friendships, um, just general relationships. Like we have all of this stuff externally and what i find is sad and, and and the most common denominator is a lack of support from family or those loved ones closest to you about your writing so you have that external pressure you have that well why don't you get a real job like how many of us writers heard that <laughs> <laughs> from people who were less than supportive <laughs> and they're like well just get a real job and you're like you know authors only make pennies off of their work you're like yeah traditionally published ones profitable yo um i mean it's not like rolling into thousands of dollars but i am profitable <laughs> um and this kind of goes to something that uh i've heard mckinsey talk about and that is that from a traditionally published uh coordinator i um i forget what what it was uh but only 20 percent of traditionally published authors actually earn out of the advance which means 80 percent don't that's a huge number so that aside like you have these external pressures on you of like expectations right and that's really what it kind of boils down to is expectations you're expected to graduate high school go to college at some you know like prestigious college and then maybe on to university and then maybe you're going to go and you know become a uh, a liar or a lawyer um fortunate slip um a doctor or you know something along those lines and you're like yeah but i, I kind of want to i want to be an author and everyone's just like <laughs> that's so cute and <laughs> you you yes. have this external pressures then i think that <laughs> moves into an internal pressure because suddenly you're going against what your really your main desire is which is to write and there's also the the other internal pressures of i'm not good enough my writing sucks no one wants to read my writing. It's you're self sabotaging yourself because you have to figure out some way to no longer want to do that. And so you're going to tell yourself all of the things that you do poorly or think you do poorly to try and convince yourself of that. 
and then you just end up salty and bitter like me. So don't go, don't go that route. Um, and that also, you know, very much helps to create imposter syndrome when you have this combination of internal and external pressures mm. and what that begins to do to somebody over time. And again, like I don't have any scientific data to back this up. What I have is 16 years of watching people and also looking at past people that I've had interactions with and talked to who are older than I am and further along in life. And it it gets you to a place long term where you've stopped pursuing a dream and you actually are embittered towards the people who do or who are pursuing their dream now that's not everybody i'm speaking very broad terms here um so you have the people who are like, yeah, you know, I tried that once too. And realistically, if you're living in the real world, uh, not this make believe world, then, you know, you need to go get a job and you need to do all these things. And it's like, yeah, in some respects, that is true. Uh, that job that you got might be the thing that informs your story later on. But if you, if you give up pursuing that passion, whether it's just as a hobby for a period of time, or it's like, yeah, this is really what I want to do. So how do I get there? Um, it leads to a place where you just are kind of a curmudgeon. <laughs> and it's also incredibly depressing because we have the, the desires and the passions for certain things for a reason. And when we're going against that simply because we're told that's what we're supposed to do, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't, it, it feels wrong. And it's because to an extent it is. Now, could I have gone about my author journey differently? Yes, I could have. And it probably would have saved me a lot of time and pain and heartache. But I didn't. Um, you know, for those who don't know, I technically never graduated high school. Um, I don't have a GED. I took one college class and that was like math 20, <laughs> like introductory to like everything just past addition, multiplication, su subtraction and division, like solving for X. Like it was like, woo, I'm there now. Um, that was my college experience. <laughs> and then after that, I was working when I was 17. Started off in fast food and then stayed in fast food for seven years, moved to insurance, then moved to retail and then was um, one of the, the maintenance guys at my church. And then during that time was developing my developmental editing, have no background in editing. I have no certificate in editing. What I had was lots and lots of reading experience and I could see how the stories fit together. And then I moved to coaching and then I was able to publish my own book. And then I got to go to work for New Degree Press as an author coach and have helped hundreds of authors along the way. So that is one of those things where it's like, yes, I had writer's block. I did all of those things, but I never stopped pursuing that passion of writing, that ultimate goal of publishing a book and then someday living off of my pen. That's my goal. And every decision that I make is usually, <laughs> the good ones anyway, <laughs> are trying to get me closer to that goal. So don't like when you get in the writer's block mindset or you have these external pressures around you, don't fall into that trap. Now, some of the things that you can do to help with that is to find other authors to write with. Um, do writing sprints. Writing sprints are so much fun. Do them with somebody. 
create a Discord channel that is for for writing sprints, and then challenge your friends to to do this with you, or start a YouTube channel, and you pick a day, one day of week, and that's going to be the day that you, for an hour, do writing sprints, or you know you do an Instagram live and you're doing writing sprints, or you go live on Twitter and you're doing writing sprints, or you do a freaking Facebook live and you do writing sprints. The point is you're trying to get people to do it with you. Now, there will probably be a big goose egg in terms of views for the first few, like especially if you've never done it before. It's going to be really awkward. I look back at my first YouTube video and, oh, man, it was bad. It was it was excruciatingly painful uh, and it was really outside of my comfort zone. But my goal was to try and meet other authors, meet other writers and people that I could journey with. You're not an island, so don't pretend to be one. <laughs> like the author Julia. journey, the author journey is something that we're supposed to be doing in community. It's one, it's just more fun. Like, cause then you get to bounce ideas around. When was the last time you're like, oh, oh my gosh, I have this great idea and I have to tell somebody about it. I do this with my poor wife and God bless her. She puts up with me. But I will go out there and I'll be like, "Hun, I had this idea. And I will start running through everything. And she'll just be like. And I know she doesn't understand a word that I'm saying because she's told me that. What a sweet but, I, but she listens. And that's all that I need. I just need somebody to hear it outside of my head. So that way then I can process it verbally. So that way it makes sense. So. Find people who are that for you and are willing to do it to you as well. The key is that you actually have to listen. <laughs> like, you don't be like regurgitating your stuff and you're like, thanks. And then you leave. Like, especially if they're another author, they may have stuff that they want to run by you. And you should sit and genuinely listen to what they have to say. It's one of the best cures for breaking down those internal and external pressures because when we're talking to other people and we are communicating with other people it allows us to slowly but surely talk about those pressures because i guarantee you when you're talking to, to that person you're like yeah my family doesn't support my writing and they're gonna be like yeah mine doesn't either and you have commonality. And then you can go, well, you know what? They may not, but I'm going to be there to encourage you. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to take that upon myself. That's something that you can give to somebody because you don't have it. And you'll also receive it back from them. So it creates that community for yourself. And it is super, super helpful. Now, when it comes to like trying to get around writer's block, I don't think you can. Uh, I imagine writer's block is a wall. And you can sit there and bang your head against it um, for hours and hours. It's not going to do a whole lot except give you a really bad headache. That's about it. Um, but what you can do is because I know you're thinking about a story. You're a writer, so you, you you want, you have the desire to do it. So take a moment and get outside. Go for a walk. Go sit on a park bench. Go play in the snow. Go rake some leaves. Like, it's fall here, so all the leaves are falling down. It's going to be, like, up to our eyeballs in snow here pretty soon, I'm pretty sure. And for you... Get out and about. Listen to music. Uh, for me, if I'm in a funk, classical music is a great kind of break because what it allows me to do, because the way that I think about writing is like a violin or an orchestra. The ebbs and flows of classical music, particularly, creates this beautiful picture in my mind. Like I think of... Um, you know, a violinist, they, they don't just sit there and just like -der 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 on the violin. They move with it, right? 
there's something beautiful about the movement and the music that it creates. So find what moves you that's not rigid. What Zara said about getting out of your normal setting, that's incredibly helpful. That's why you see writers in uh, herds at coffee houses. One, it's dangerous to go alone. And two, it smells like coffee. We're all addicted to it. So let's not even pretend. And <laughs> it's background noise. There's conversations. There's, it feels alive. The only thing that's alive in this basement right now are my kids. And they're just loud. So, <laughs> so that's, not, that's not like a peaceful thing. But when you're out, you're, you're listening to music. Do, do something else to, to shake up the normal routine and give yourself a freaking break. That's the other thing. If you're going to actually break down the walls and have more consistency, because here's the thing, internal and external pressures are not going to go away. They will ebb and flow. And they'll be really, really bad one, one month or one day. And it could last a couple of months, but you can work with that. If you go, you know what? I'm feeling like a failure. I'm feeling like this. I, I just feel this weight kind of crushing down on me. Do something else. Focus on something else. Take a breath. Take a step back from the writing. I had to do this for three months before I finally had that oh, that's how that part of the story works. And it was when I finally stopped trying so hard and I just relaxed. And I've learned since then how to manage those internal and external pressures. At the moment, you know, I'm writing book two. I have the external pressures of all the people who are wanting book two. And I have the internal pressure of feeling like I can I can I actually deliver that? Like that that's something that we wrestle with as authors. So as you can think about these things, try to stop yourself before you spiral. See it coming and then be like, you know what? I'm going to be preemptive about that. And I'm going to go do something. I'm going to go take a break. Just Even if it's just five minutes, I'm just going to go outside. I'm just going to sit on the pack steps and just breathe for five minutes. Enjoy the sunshine. Enjoy listening to the wind. Take enjoyment from things. And that will actually help you a lot. Um, now, this is the Preptober finale. And Zara has curated some wonderful questions that I definitely want to dive into here. And the first of which is, who has the most significant impact on your writing? Zara, why don't you start us off? All righty then. Um, so I'll, I'll start by my influences. So by professional influences, I'm going to say Leo Tolstoy, Simone de Beauvoir. From contemporary writers, I would say J.K. Rowling, Cassandra Clare, and Heather Gray Stewart. Now, as far as um, those are the people that, is, that inspire me. And as far as more of a personal side of my life goes probably my mother <laughs> um because she's the only one who supports my writing career which is very rare given the background that she grew up at basically and with all the other influences that she had placed on her it is incredibly rare um, for a person, for a mother to be so open-minded and so supportive. So whenever I stumble upon the imposter syndrome entering my life again, I just call her. And yeah, that 
and that influences my writing probably the most um, because support is essential, as Stephen said. And I am very well aware how lucky I am to have at least one person, that person being a member of my family to that, <laughs> um, that is very happy for me, very proud of me and very supportive. That's awesome. Yeah, I uh, I have uh, Tolstoy did War and Peace, correct? It's that yes. massive book that's like this thick. The Brick, yes, but yeah. actually, War and Peace isn't my favorite. <laughs> it's I love long books, but even that one is too long for me. And um, Natasha and Pierre, two whiny babies, <laughs> not my <laughs> not, not my favorite novel, but um, my the novel that influenced me the most that I always go back to is, uh, is Anna Karenina. So mm -hmm. that's why. Yeah. I haven't read any of, uh, Tolstoy's work. I have war and peace on my shelf because I, I found it at, uh, or it was, it was up for, for grabs for free at our library. I was like, I need some Tolstoy in my life. And then I looked should, at the size yes. of it. I was like, man, that's going to be like three years worth of reading right there. Yes. <laughs> Just to get through it. I, I haven't found a medium yet that would um, <laughs> that would all I don't want to say authentically, but let's say in a fun way, adapt War and Peace. And my conclusion is that <laughs> it's not a very good novel. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know that it's a classic and I love classics. I mean, um, people who know me know that very well. But um and that includes, actually, I'm not sure if you're aware, but there's like this really, really weird electric pop opera called The Great Comet of 1812. And it focuses on a very specific um, passage in War and Peace. I think Josh, Josh Groban even started it on Broadway. <laughs> That's why it caught my eye. And it's just not even that. I mean, when you say War and Peace and electric pop opera, you would think, man, this is going to be probably terrible but i'll have a blast right right it's, no no not no it's just doesn't matter if it's a series or a movie or electric pop opera war and peace is just not a good novel <laughs> to read or to adapt but um that's personal opinion of course but um yeah but anna karenina is something else man <laughs> that is something yeah else. i'll have to i'll have to find that one uh keep an eye out for it um I would say as far as what I would define as um, classic would be Tolkien and his work. Um, just the, the sheer literary and linguistic genius that is the Lord of the Rings and the Cimmerillion and like the entire history of Middle Earth is just mind boggling to me. Um, that is, that influenced so much of my life growing up. Cause I mean, I finished the, the fellowship of the ring when I was 10 and it was just before the movies came out. I'm dating myself here considerably. Um, but I, I went and saw the Lord of the Rings movies in the theater as a kid. I was just like, Oh, this is the best thing ever. <laughs> it was amazing. Um, but yeah, that um frank herbert's dune um for the political machinations and just the the scope mm. of his books were just absolutely mind-boggling um and then i've started to read more classics like i'm reading through beowulf right now um which mm. is just beautiful prose yes beautiful. um and i have pride and prejudice and i want to actually read through that uh, but yeah, but I, I think one of the things is one of the, I think, key essentials is missing from a lot of authors nowadays um, is a lack of appreciation for the classics, which I can understand because like as a kid, I did not appreciate them at all. As an adult, I appreciate them way more because of the language and the way they phrased things yes. was so much more eloquent and thoughtful than the herb to der that we have in most books now. <laughs> um, 
yeah, it's just it's a, it was a different time and we can learn from that and glean really good, very strong skills from that, from storytelling. And so that's one of the reasons why I love the cl um, classical books. Um, I would say in terms of um, modern authors, we have, for me, uh, like Ted Decker. Uh, he writes Christian and he's very, uh, it's like kind of like psychological thrillers for yes. most of his stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they're just fantastic. Some of them, they just raise the hair on the back of your neck. You're like, <laughs> um, I love that. Frank Peretti was another big one. Um, Stephen R. Lawhead, um, fantastic, uh, Celtic fantasy, uh, high fantasy, um, Arthurian legend retellings. He did a Robin Hood retelling that I, by the time I was done, I was ready to walk out into the woods, hack down a tree and make a bow. Like I was going <laughs> to just go full Robin Hood. Like right That's some good there. writing right there. Oh, it was so good. Cause it was based in like historical whales. Mm -hmm. And it was super intriguing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, those ones specifically. Um, and then personally, I think it comes down to, to primarily, uh, you know, two people. One is my wife. You know, she has been a tremendous support. And honestly, like there was a time where I, I took that for granted. And I'm learning to not do that because she is the one of one of the key reasons why the city of snow and stars even got published and her belief in me has kept me going all of these years when i was just ready to just say oh, <laughs> <I> know, <laughs> that's it feeling. out the window <laughs> man our uh, women just wonderful <laughs> <laughs> they are yes and not written well by most men i must say um yes, <laughs> oh yeah oh it was painful um and then i think um most importantly has been god you know obviously i'm a christian author um i'm one of the few christian authors will actually admit that they're a christian author <laughs> and i write my my work is geared more for christians but i mean i've had people from um hindu to pagan uh and to atheist just they loved the book Ew, because i'm not i'm not preaching at anybody mm. i'm dealing with hard topics that most people in the church within fiction writing don't address and so they appreciated that and because i'm showing m multiple sides and none of the characters are perfect. A lot of them are very morally gray. And they, ha while they have relationships with God, they still struggle, just like mm. I have struggled. Mm. Um, but God's influence through my writing has, in many ways, saved me from very, very dark times. And so I would say that that's probably the single most... Uh, like the biggest influence um, because that predates, you know, my wife by uh, several years. And so that, that is what it kind of looks like for me on the landscape, you know, personally, you know, like who is most, uh, who has had the most significant impact in my writing. I love that. That is very cool. And I love your point about objectivity in writing. It is my very, <laughs> probably um, my biggest belief when it comes to writing that our job is not to declare a position on anything. Our job is to bring people's attention to many, many issues that we as a society, we as a world struggle with, show all aspects of it, all aspects of spectrum, be like, here it is. <laughs> and many characters in our book they can declare a position, but if we declare a position, if it's adamant in our writing, adamant, if we're adamant about writing to declare a position, it's, it's just, you can see 
that it's there. <laughs> we can we can we cannot hide it there isn't a way around it people will know that oh this author is very is being very preachy not through a character declaring a position that's a completely different thing um so yeah i appreciate you saying that that is yeah <laughs> and yeah. it's hard isn't it because it is because like our opinions and that's fine but we can't do that i hear olivia coleman from the crown <laughs> playing the queen going the moment we smile or talk. We all have declared a position, a point of view, <laughs> and we can't. We can't. We nope. just can't. It's not. It's not. It's not morally right. Well, and that's that's what, um, in many respects, what I pull from. You know, like the likes of Dune, or the likes of the Cimmerillion, is mm -hmm. that they like. We all know uh, Tolkien was a very devout Catholic. And whether yes. he whether he wanted to ever admit to it or, or not, like it's very clearly shows up in his writing. Yes, but it's never so. a you know smack across the face. It's just this is the the world that he built. Yeah, yeah. and I, I appreciate about that. Um, and it's like i i will declare a position personally outside of my books yes but in my books <laughs> very loudly I, very loudly <laughs> and and i'm okay with that and then it'll put some people off and it's like hey that's okay but in my books i'm like but like i'm still human while i may while i may say something here and i will take a firm stance on it that doesn't mean that i'm going to shove it down your throat in a mm -hmm. book because it, this is storytelling Mm -hmm. this is our job as storytellers is to communicate ideas from all facets and present them to readers in a thoughtful manner. And if we can do that successfully, like that is ha -ha, success in writing. <laughs> I, I completely agree. And that's why I have hard time. Um, even though I write literary fiction, you know, that has many Roman subplots, whatever you want to call it. I love horror and I have, I have a hard time <laughs> coming to like, <laughs> um, Stevens, Stevens Botch, Botsky is his name. I, I believe so. Steven Jbotsky. Um, he wrote the perks of being a wallflower also directed mm. the movie. And recently he, I don't know why, but he transitioned into horror, which is a very dear genre to me because I grew up reading Stephen King. And it is probably one of the best novels ever written. <laughs> and I even enjoyed the movie. Very good adaptation, which is very hard to do. Um, and the reason why I cannot learn to love or come to love Stephen Jabotsky's horror is because I can see a clear difference between him and Stephen King. Stephen King never declares a position in his book on anything. While as Stephen Chbotsky, he downright preaches to us about Catholicism as well. I, I noticed um, in one of his books, and I'm blanking which one it is. Haley Newham will be able to tell you. <laughs> one of his latest horror attempts. Um, I remember that he, th there was like a strong theme of Catholicism, um, Roman Catholicism. And it's just, I couldn't finish that book. That's why I don't remember the name <laughs> because I don't even know. But I, I clearly remember that um, the moment the writers start being preachy in their books, that's where, that's where they lose me completely. Um, let me make my own opinion. So, right. yeah. yep. Cause readers aren't stupid exactly <laughs> so don't 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 treat them like they are <laughs> yeah yeah that's true yeah but many modern authors and contemporary writers they treat audiences as if they were stupid um and apart yep. from the beautiful prose the eloquence that has gotten lost over the years um from the that you don't see anymore that used to be in the in the, in the classics apart from that there's also a sense of um there's a disconnect, if that makes sense. I, I, I don't feel connected to many stories these days. Maybe because because of the digital era, like people's inner worlds are not as rich. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So maybe there's a disconnect 
because of that. But um, yeah, I don't feel the connection. <laughs> it's, just, it's yeah, very, very few writers, authors that I read contemporary um, can make me feel connected to the story. And that's a yeah. shame. That's such a shame. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think that gets into um, a lot of the, the mechanics of writing that are uh, cast out the window for right to market. Mm. And then people take that a little too literally. And then <laughs> they just pull a Nicholas Sparks and it's the same book with a different cover and some rain. Uh, but we won't dive down that rabbit hole. Uh, that's an entirely no. different stream. <laughs> um, what has been the biggest success, b your biggest success in writing? Hmm. I would, opinions differ. <laughs> opinions vary. Opinions differ. Um, probably, huh. I would say my biggest success was my proudest moment and that was when my book got actually published mm. <laughs> that moment when i published it and then the advanced copies arrived the pre-orders for my audience and i unpacked it and i had the book in my hand and i was like man this is yeah you know it's a debut novel you know what i mean it probably won't be the best one i'll ever write but it's it, it would always hold a special place in my heart and um yeah the biggest success is that i got published <laughs> honestly from my point yeah. of view at least yeah absolutely uh i mean getting getting published is you know i i think for a lot of people they they look at you know, the way that we did it, which is hybrid publishing or just straight mm -hmm. self-publishing um, as, as an easy route. And it, it really isn't easy um, by any stretch of the imagination is just as difficult, if not more difficult than it's more difficult <laughs> than traditionally publishing. And, you know, and I and to, to be clear for those who are watching, like we're not dissing any of the different any of the publishing routes it's it no they're all it valid. differs widely from author to author yeah and how you define success is going mm -hmm. to be very exactly. very different i think for me the like holding the book in my hand was a very surreal feeling and it really didn't it it really didn't sink in for like months months yeah uh, um, <laughs> I just kept looking at it and be like, who wrote that? Oh, yeah. Right. I, I did that. And then I'm reading through it. I'm laughing at my own writing. I'm like, man, this is really good. Like, <laughs> <laughs> this is like, this is awesome. Um, but I think the, I think success for me is not how many reviews I have, not how many sales I've made, although I would yeah. like more as any author would. Um, it is the reaction from the people who have read the book, who it touched. Mm. That to me is where the success in the book lies. Very much so. Because the topics that I touch on in my book, abuse in physical, mental, sexual, emotional, human trafficking, and the question of why does God let bad things happen? Mm. As someone who's been through abuse, mm -hmm. This is very much my heart and soul on paper. Mm. And I address that in the author's note. Mm. And the people who have read it and then who have gone through that, that same type of trauma or mm. similar trauma, who have reached out, one posted on their uh, their Facebook, uh, excuse me, um, their Instagram. And they were like, I had a lot of these things kind of come back up to the surface before I dove into this book. Mm. And she was like, I felt like I could breathe. I felt seen hmm. because that's, and that was my heart in the book is, is so that way those people who have been through that, they understand that someone understands and they don't have to say anything about it. They just no. know that someone understands where they're from. And that to me is success is that, it got out 
and it has been touching people's lives since. And that is beautiful for me. All of the other stuff, you know, money and whatnot. Rudimentary. That, <laughs> rudimentary. That's the basics. But that for me is not success. That help. That's a means to an end to help get more books out there. Mm -hmm. um, but Same. the actual success are the people who read the book. That's where that's what it boils down to for me. Oh, that is beautiful. Oh, yes, very much so. I can relate to that. Um, yeah, when um, what is most surprising to me is the range of audience that my book has acquired. Um, it's a young adult novel. So I was writing it for young people, you know, venting. <laughs> and the, the most surprising thing to me is that not only um, because it is predominantly for female audience, young adult female audience. And the most surprising thing to me is that not only women who are in their late 30s or 40s or even 50s have read it and loved it and told me that they could relate so much to the main heroine. Um, but also men have read it and were like, oh yeah, <laughs> I know a girl like that. <laughs> <laughs> like, thanks. <laughs> so um, yeah, you're completely right. It's yeah, that's that's the that's the biggest success and just warms our hearts when people come to us and say, Oh yeah, I've been through this. I know mm -hmm. what you're talking about. Yep, exactly. Uh, so which story arc do you find the most interesting? And I'll, I'll limit this to our own books. Okay. Um, just for the sake of brevity and, <laughs> uh, yes. I think. So you go first. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I think for me in, in mine and it, it's hard because most of the people who have read book one, they don't know that it's actually part of tw a 12 book series that's planned. And don't tell what, them. <laughs> yeah. Well, they know now uh, <laughs> if any of them find it and read it. Uh, it's part of a 12 book series planned. And <laughs> I'm um, just kidding. It's so cool. I can't wait. <laughs> but the, I, I think within the city of snow and stars, the the character art that I find the most fascinating is actually Jaden's. Same. Because <laughs> he wasn't supposed to be how he is in this book. Mm -hmm. And he was supposed to be a total twerp. Mm -hmm. And he was going to sell Trinia as mm -hmm. a way to get what he wanted. Mm -hmm. And then one of my readers basically said, don't you dare. Mm -hmm. I was like, <laughs> Noted. <laughs> and the way that his arc is going to go over this trilogy, I find super fascinating. Um, and I'm working very hard because I heard from several people um, who have read the first book saying that they kind of felt like the, the male characters kind of overshadowed Trinia and, I, I would agree with that. Um, it wasn't it wasn't an intentional thing. Yeah. Um, but I want to make sure that Trinia is showcased more appropriately in book two because it, it it revolves around her and where. <sighs> but Jaden was an, a very interesting surprise. Mm -hmm. Um, a very very interesting surprise in how he grows over the course of the book. And I think that really he has probably the most growth out of any of the character arcs. Um, surprisingly, mm -hmm. it, it, it took me by surprise. Um, and I'm sure I'm, I still will be surprised by <laughs> how he ends up in yeah. book two and book three. But yeah, I, I would definitely say Jaden is, um, He's the small bean of the uh, the reader community, and um, they're not going to be happy with me by book two. But oh, my God. And no spoilers, though. 
Yeah, no spoilers. No spoilers. They're not going to be happy. <laughs> yes. Um, for me, I would say, um, so first of all, I think I mentioned this before, um, the sto storytelling device and the story arc that I love to see most in books in general is the red herring one. Mm. It takes me by surprise every time. Like I consider myself a pretty intelligent person. <laughs> But th this one, if it's done well, and usually in the books that I read, it's done really well. Um, I love that the most. Um, now, as f as for my book, my novel, I would say the character of Damon, Cecilia's father, just because I didn't know how much growth he was able to go through or how much growth I was able to give him as a character, as a person you know because your characters are people and um you know when you write a character that is inherently selfish and is after only one thing and that's comfort comfortable life money whatever it is does doesn't matter comfortable life um and it's so embedded in him that i wasn't yeah for a long time i was like i don't think that it would be very convincing if he had so much growth as to sacrifice himself for his family i don't think that's possible but then i was writing and writing and writing scenes with him and his daughter in one room and by observing her selflessness and the way she treats her friends and her mother um he kind of learns from her so by the end of the book, I was like, okay, I think I can make, it wouldn't be too much of a stretch. It wouldn't be too much of a jump for him to do something selfless. Just this one thing. So, yeah. <laughs> I love it when characters just show up and, and surprise us. <laughs> they always like, do. They always yeah, do. It's just like, you weren't supposed to do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But and then you know it's like wow that actually works you know okay well mm. you'll i guess you'll live till book two yes. <laughs> you have appeased me <laughs> <laughs> all right guys well this is it this we've is come it. to the end of october it's time for nano i'm not ready it's going to be crazy it's going to be utter utter chaos but it's going to be fun we're all going to be doing it together Yes. So, guys, if you haven't already, make sure to go subscribe and to also <laughs> go and <laughs> check out. <laughs> I know everything's mirrored. Uh, go in and check out on the homepage <laughs> of our YouTube channel is a list of all of the nano videos that are coming up. All you have to do is click that set reminder for all of them. So that way YouTube will send you the notifications yes. when we are going live. It's going to be every single Monday from 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern time for an hour. And we're going to have a quick topic at the beginning, and then we're going to dive into writing sprints, and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end to answer questions that you guys have about how the frick do we novel. And it's going to be a great time, so make sure that you guys go and sign up for that. We hope that you've gotten a lot out of these videos. We hope that we've encouraged you um, as you go through your writing process, developing it and pursuing your passion for writing. Keep pursuing it. Don't stop believing. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I'm sorry. I hate I, that it, song and I hate it, you. <laughs> It was just, it was too good of a moment. Uh, I hate that out. song. <laughs> Everybody have a wonderful rest of your night. We'll see you next week.